it's just me and you alone never lonely thank you so much chris for being here um for the interview it's so excited to have you um can you start by telling a little bit about yourself sure i'm chris williams i'm the chef and owner of uh lucille's fine foods which is in houston in the museum district we just celebrated our eighth anniversary in august uh, we do Southern cuisine with global influences, and we also play, and we also honor my great grandmother, the namesake of the restaurant, who was a chef pioneer, trailblazer, and we serve two of her original recipes that are over 100 years old. I'm also the founder of Lucille's 1913, which is a nonprofit that I started <clears throat> um, when the world changed at the beginning of the pandemic. We first started off feeding first responders to the tune of 3,000 people in the first 15 days. Uh, targeting the graveyard shift specifically, and then that evolved into us uh, targeting um, our elderly community mm -hmm. and impoverished neighborhoods. And so to date, we've donated over 145,000 mills. Wow. Uh, yeah, we just did a huge drop in Third Ward, a historically black neighborhood um, that has its own challenges of 5,000 mills. And we were fortunate enough to get some really good partners and were able to donate $100,000 worth of $100 gift cards to them as well. Yeah. Our latest project that we have going on for MLK Day will be another 2,000 mil drop, and we're going to three different locations at once. These are smaller towns that are outside of Houston, and one of them is in Houston, which is Fifth Ward, which is, you know, one of the neighborhoods I was partially brought up in, um, historically black, um, full of need, and uh, yeah, so... That, that, that's the rundown of where we are now. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. I mean, to have done so much in the pandemic coming and really giving back to the community that you're from. But I also like, like you said, you're going outside of the city because sometimes those places get overlooked with these kind of charity, right? So that's excellent. And I'm excited to learn more about that. Um, can you talk, you say you grew up um, somewhat in Houston's Fifth Ward. So can you talk a little bit more about yourself, your upbringing and how you kind of got into cooking in the first place? Yeah, sure. So I, I'm from the Southwest side of Houston. Um, and so my parents are from Brenham and, um, and my best friend growing up, Franco Lee, the third, his father was the county commissioner and he's from Fifth Ward. And he's so old school in Fifth Ward that he built his huge house on top of the house that his mother raised him in. Wow. And so with Franco and I, we used to just like the way the school year went and especially summer vacations, we just alternate. Like you spend a month over at my house and then I'll spend a month over at your house. And my mom was telling the story the other day is like uh, <laughs> one summer I was going over there for a month and I, she, you know, they gave me the freedom to pack up my own stuff. And so I had my two bags ready to go and I get up over there. And then I, Kay, uh, Franco's mom <laughs> calls my mom. She's like, so did you see what your boy packed? And she's like, nah, I just trusted he's going to do the right thing. She's like, and she took a picture of it. <laughs> It was just full of toys. No clothes, no toothbrush, <laughs> nothing. You knew what you were going for, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had a plan. Um, but the great thing about growing up between those two um, approaches was that Uncle Franco, Fifth Ward guy, he was, he was, you know, that's where I learned about boudin, tea cakes, and hardcore jazz. My parents were more, um, a little bit more conservative. And uh, so you marry those two things together and it, it just, you know, it gives you a really good perspective on us. That makes sense. So can you talk more then about when you were going between those two houses, um, you talked about like jazz and things like that, where you're also exposed to different types of cuisine um, between the two houses where the parents cooks. How did that work? Yeah. So, you know, in Fifth Ward, Uncle Franco and I, Kay, they did mostly, you know, it was traditional, um, what, we'd approach, what, we'd, what we call soul food. No, like I said, the tea cakes, the boudin, all, all that kind of like really deep, you know, stuff. And then um, at my parents' house, my mom was a terrible cook, still is. Well, now she's getting better. And my dad was like, my dad could burn. And so we go out to like great restaurants and stuff. And then two weeks later, my dad would like re recreate that mill like verbatim. So it's like the exact same thing, exact same plating, exact same flavors, everything. So we had a little bit, it was a little bit more refined and, and, and uh, it, it hit more of a global, you know, we had global flavors at our table at my parents' house. Um, and Uncle Franco's house, I got the balance. And it was all delicious. I mean, that sounds cool that you were getting so many perspectives as a young child. Can you talk a little bit more about the tea cake and the boudin, I think you said? I know tea cake from um, 
this like novel, um, Zora Neale no she calls the character tea cake and it's some kind of like, like deep South Florida delicacy, but that's, I'm a California girl. So I, I'll, I don't, can you discuss a little bit more what these things are? Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> that's the only thing I've heard it from. <laughs> that's that you had to go to a Zora Neale Hurston novel to get your tea cake reference. All right. Well, somebody needs to ship you some tea cakes. I don't know how to make them, so it's not going to be me. But tea cakes is like just a this just a staple simple cookie made with flour, mm -hmm. sugar. I don't. I mean, it's one of the most simple recipes. But so many people have so many different versions on them. I was talking to my parents about it the other day. How they you know they start going back to how Uncle Reggie's tea cakes were nice and thin and crispy, and then aunt whoever her tea cakes were nice and fluffy and pillowy and mm -hmm. it's just it's just a, a it's just the staple um sweet i guess in the south for our culture specifically boudin is um is a something that's born out of new out of louisiana and this is this is like dirty rice that's put in like sausage casing oh. in the intestines and it's just it's just it's just dirty rice in, inside of that and it's made into a sausage it's delicious it's addictive it's spicy and I believe there's some Creole roots on, on Kay's side of the family, which is why I played such a big part at the, the dinner table mm -hmm. with us. Well, very cool. That definitely is cool. I mean, when you talk about, right, Creole references, we all know, um, you know, of course, Beyonce is well known in Houston, the whole Creole heritage. So that makes sense um, that that's there as well as the soul food references. So that's very exciting. So when did you get in the kitchen, though? So you were enjoying all this good food. When did you start um, learning? Um, yeah, so I started... Uh, I mean, like I said, I was always around, I'm the youngest of three. Mm -hmm. And so I was just always, like I spent a lot of time at my grandmother's house and on my father's side, she was a great cook. I mean, she was one of those cooks that had like the jar of bacon fat sitting in the windowsill and pull it out and use it for every single thing that she'd do. Mm -hmm. And have me working in the kitchen doing, you know, snapping her peas, peeling the leaves from the stems on the collard greens and all, all vegetable prep work. <clears throat> so I always had, you know, a love and like even back then I it was like a, the idea that was very romantic to me like it just you know the process the slow process mm -hmm. of preparing a meal for your family and you know of course back then the sun was brighter the air was cleaner and you just I just remember these beautiful little moments of just sitting in the kitchen and my grandmother talking to me and the lights just hitting her and I'm sitting over there pulling these greens for her and we're doing you know collard greens especially the way she cooked them which is braising them for like eight hours or some shit you'd have to um that's a lot of greens when you're feeding six people yeah because you know when you cook greens you have a big pot and then it turns out to be this much at the end so I'm sure you had a lot of prep work <laughs> yeah yeah but I mean like I, I love those moments and um you know just the music that was associated with it. me and my great-grandmother we listened to a lot of big band jazz because I was really into jazz at that point I was trying to find something you know spoke to her and I found it um so yeah, that, that those memories have always like romanticized, you know, cooking for me. And then, um, so I guess you can say as, as young as eight, nine, eight or nine. Yeah, I'm starting to do those little prep work for. And then that just, I didn't know it, but I just made me fall in love with the industry and cooking as a whole um, from then on. Wow, that's a beautiful, just like a vision of that, right? Of, of having that kind of like Southern grandmother that's passing on those things for you. So that's very exciting. So when did you go from prep work to deciding this is going to be my career? I'm going to be a chef. Shit. Um, well, my first, uh, the only work I've done for the most part has been in the restaurant industry. And I started over at Chili's Restaurant um, as a server. And that's when I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the chaos of restaurants. I was like 17. And um, it just, I just like that energy and like, you know, it's just this organized confusion. Everybody's just running around, you're dropping plates, you're yelling at each other and then you're having a good time afterwards. Like it just really spoke to me. Um, and so from there, and I only made it in that job for two months before I was fired, but somehow. You're having a real good time then, huh? Yeah, I had a blast, I had a blast. <laughs> and, so, and then from there I went to, you know, I, I went backwards, I went to a busser and then back to server, then the bartender, terrible bartender, because I didn't like engaging with people that much. Mm -hmm. um, I like the server component because you just have to deal with people in like 30 second increments, mm -hmm. you know, like your impact and just get out of there. Yeah, but you don't want to like chat people up while they're sitting there. For oh, you. I did back then. I didn't care about your life and all that kind of stuff. And I definitely didn't have anything to share because I'm 17 years old. Like, what are we going to talk about? Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, but yeah, I, I still love that energy. And I didn't find out that I wanted to be a chef until, and this is even after I went to culinary school. And I went to culinary school just because college wasn't for me. I went to Hampton briefly, went to TSU, went to 
UDC, went to a bunch of places and just didn't love it. Never loved it. And then I tried culinary school and didn't love that either. Like I always tell people that we were just like mutually unimpressed with each other, me and culinary school, but I still love the industry. <clears throat> and so I left there and moved to Europe and uh, uh, England specifically. And I started working with this hardcore Irish chef named Sean Devlin. And I still call him like one of my culinary fathers and we're still in touch to this day. And it took me about three months to understand what he was saying, like where we could like speak and like really get, I mean, I understand kitchen speak, but conversational talk, I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And then after I got it, and it was, this was a two man operation for an 80 seat restaurant and the menu we created every single day based off of what the fishmongers, the farmers and everybody would bring in from us, we'd write the menus that day. And my job was to do first and last, which means I did all the appetizers, I did all the desserts, and I did all the dishes all by myself. And if he got overwhelmed in the kitchen doing the entrees, then I'd fly up over there and go help him with that. And that's when I got addicted to it and went from being like my hustle to like my passion and then ultimately led to being my career. Wait, so you got addicted there where you were literally working that hard and under that <laughs> pressure? <laughs> you got it. It's like, I like it to hurt. If it doesn't hurt, then I don't know what the point of it is. Wow, that's that's very commendable that you were doing that much work. Just really quickly, I want to go back to when you said that you and culinary school didn't get along. Was it more so that you didn't like the not being in the real world? Did you like like what was it about culinary school specifically that you didn't like? Um, the well, the first thing is the second word in it, school. Oh. Um, yeah, and two, two, it was a new program. Didn't really have it together, and uh, but I mean, but I didn't have any, I didn't have any metrics for that. So this is I just didn't I just don't dig school. I didn't like you out know, there get like kind of getting it done. Yeah, yeah. I just rather like just go experience stuff, and I don't. Yeah, it's just you know hammering over the same thing over and over and over again. Give it to me once, and then let me go put it in practice, and then mm -hmm. we can move on. Um, nice. Yeah, and then you know, so it's never been like a real conformist, so they didn't like that either. <laughs> but it gave me some good knife skills. Like my, I got my knife skills out of there, at least the basis for it and basic terms, which allowed me to go and work through Europe all over from London, Lithuania, and still be able to like, you know, get the job done. That's very cool though. I think the learning by doing things, especially in the kitchen, right? You can read as much as you want, cookbooks, et cetera, but unless you get in there and do it, you're never gonna really improve. So it sounds like you got an amazing education overseas. So you said you were in London, Lithuania, were you at anywhere else before? What made you decide to come back to the States? Uh, my brother, so I was, I was everywhere, London, everywhere in between. I lived in, uh, France, I lived in Spain, I lived in Italy, lived in uh, shit, Germany, um, and cooked or bartended in all those places. Like, like I said, it was my hustle. Uh, that, that it became my, it was my hustle that turned into my passion and then was also my livelihood. That's how I could, you know, make it in all these places. Uh, when I was, I left Lithuania and I was stuck in Germany and my, the, my older brother, well, both of my brothers are older, um, said, uh, he had two daughters and I had just met the oldest one. I hadn't met the, the younger one. Mm -hmm. And he was like, dude, come home and meet your, your niece. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I found a flight and the cheapest flight I can get to this side of the Atlantic was to the place that I am now, which is Halifax, Nova Scotia. Yeah. And so I looked on a map and I was like, well, that looks like it's about six hours away from DC. So if I can get to Nova Scotia, then somehow I'll come up with some money and I'll make it down to DC. And then eventually I'll make it down to Houston. Wow. I get to Nova Scotia, no money. Cigarettes cost $16 a pack, so that wiped me out. Because um, <laughs> you gotta have a smoke before you have live, or you, you have living quarters, or, or water. You gotta get your cigarettes on. And so. Very so, death like, right? <laughs> so I ended up uh, um, staying here for, I think, a year and a half, ended up meeting the mother of my children. Um, and then I make it down to DC and become and then when I found out I have a son on the way then I, I went from being a line cook like this hired gun that was just going around to different places at like nine dollars an hour to being like the executive chef of the 175 million dollar hotel within four months wow you got on there quick you're like I have to like get ready and prepare for this next we got, chapter. Babies, we got babies I can't be this bum living this peripatetic lifestyle anymore like we got an extra mouth to feed and so uh that changed the game, but I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for that position. I only lasted, I think, four months in D.C., and I was in D.C., and D.C. is such a small, you know, it's a small town with a big city feel, but in the culinary scene, people are watching you, and so they saw that meteoric rise and fall, 
And uh, which meant that it was like, you know, people like, yeah, if you want to come work for me, we'd love to have you, but you're going to be pulling potatoes. And like, I'm like, let's start from the, from the base again. Yeah, you can start over. And I was like, well, the hell with that. I, I can't do that now because there's a reason why I did this. So we came back to Houston and um, worked with the, probably one of the best chefs I've ever worked with, Robert Gatsby. <laughs> um, and that's where I met uh, the chef over at Lucille's, Kang Hong. And we've been partners for 10 years now. Um, that, that's who I built these souls with. So it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was quite the journey. And the Canadian culinary scene was nothing but fine tuning the art of boiling ham and potatoes and putting mustard on it. I'm glad it's a lot's changed since then because now the scene's pretty dope. Mm. Uh, but back then it was pretty not dope. Well, it seems cool though. It seems like every, like your journey leading up to now, right? Being the owner of Lucille's has been kind of like a series of adventures where you just kind of have like met different things and then got there. So it's a pretty exciting trajectory. Um, not at all just like going to culinary school and getting a job straight out. Your experiences I'm sure have made you been able to have such a successful restaurant. So can you talk some about being the chef and owner of Lucille's in Houston? What has been your experience um, there, especially as a black restaurateur? What was it like starting a restaurant from the ground up? Like you talked about the difficulty of being an executive chef. So what was it like starting your own thing? Um, I wasn't prepared for it. Like I've run restaurants from, you know, three different continents, but I had never had done this. And uh, it was... Um, I mean, it was new territory because Lucille's been open for eight years, eight and a half years now. And we started the process 10 years ago. And before we hit Houston, before we hit the scene, Houston's the fourth largest market in the country. The largest um, has most restaurants per capita than any other spot in the country. Like, I think it's close to 15,000, or at least it was before the pandemic had not changed everything, of course, unfortunately. But when we hit the scene, there are only three um, mediums for black, for black restaurateurs to showcase their talents. Barbecue, breakfast, soul food. And, um, and you, you played, and Houston, as diverse as it is, was also, and still kind of is, very segregated as far as like the dining scene. The only, person, only restaurants that get everybody are Mexican restaurants because it's low cost of entry and you know exactly what you're going to get. You know what I mean? You're going to get a lot of tortillas, you're going to get some grilled stuff, and you're going to get some, some beans and salsa whatever uh, and so i deliberately with my background i wanted to shake all that up i wanted to have a restaurant that was for everybody because a lot of the experience that i saw in europe which were great was like these you go to these restaurants and they're like these big communal dining tables so you just go sit down you don't know who's sitting next to you but you're having a drink you're having some food and next thing you know you've made you know a friend for the next hour you're not going to cultivate the right relationship typically because you drank too much to where you're not, you're not even going to remember them. But for that moment, you got a buddy. And so I wanted to recreate that in Houston. And um, Houston was excited about it when I named, you know, it was after my great grandmother and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's what the press was saying they were excited about. But they had also had their own ideas of what we were supposed to be. <clears throat> and so we open up and they just blast us. You know what I mean? Like they, they came after me. I remember the first review, I was only open three months and the rule of thumb is that you wait, you give a restaurant six months to get their shit together before you come after them. But they couldn't wait. Three months in, uh, I go up in there and my staff is all huddled around the laptop and I'm like, yeah, what's going on, man? We got work to do, let's go. And they're like, yeah, you need to see it. <laughs> and I see this review and this person, uh, Catherine Shulcutt, I'll never remember a terrible name. She wrote this review that was like, I thought that I had dated her and been like, like ghosted her like four times. Like I have wronged this person. Like they were coming I've from done me. something really bad. And maybe not to her, but to her mom, like something happened. And so I'm reading this shit and I was like, okay, is this my restaurant they're talking about? Like everything. Cause we had grown our own uh, peppers and vegetables and we had pickled them and put those little vinegar bottles on the table. She said, I bought that stuff from Ross. The granite tables that I had, she said they were fake granite. Like it was just, it okay. was. I need you to go through your memory and think about if you have wrong this woman before. <laughs> I, I remember yeah. like, this trust, is trust me, I went all the way through it, and uh, and I couldn't believe it, right? And um, and I was like, this is attack. Like they're trying to shut me down. And so without thinking, I just responded immediately. I was like, this is the most unprofessional piece of shit that I've ever seen in my life. And a tip to any new restaurant that's opened up, if the Houston press is trying to review you, or if they're asking you to advertise with them, do it now because they're just, they'll attack you if you don't. <clears throat> and then this turned into a whole thing. Like it's just a, 
a big like it motive like it, it it polarized the city you either one side or on the other and so i had to go back into work the next day and i had to look my staff in the eye and i'd be like yo so uh you know what happened you know that everybody is going to be coming here because they expect us to close because after an article like that comes out that's what you do you shut down mm -hmm. we're not shutting down um what we're going to do is we're going to take this as an opportunity to show them exactly who we are, why we're here, and what we do. And I'll, I'll guarantee you this. I will be on that line cooking every single dish every single day until people understand what we do. And it took six months of that kind of commitment. <clears throat> and the good thing about that piece is, like, it did drive business. It was bananas because people want to see the circus before it's over. Yeah. I mean, it's press, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they came and they saw it and we wowed them. We did what we, what, we, what we were supposed to do. We did it the right way. And then we had a real professional reviewer come in, Allison Cook, and she gave us um, a review that a review is supposed to be something she can take from the review. You can learn from it. You can implement those things to make the changes to make your restaurant better, like a real audit, a, a proper audit. Exactly. Um, yeah. And then I could take a day off. And so, um, so that was that was one big part but the biggest thing with the houston thing is like i said we kind of changed the, the game as far as like showing the black of viability or the viability of black owned restaurants and how you could do more outside of this limited framing that we have to exist in where either breakfast soul food or, or barbecue but you could do something else you could hire different people you can serve different people you can operate on a high level and, and it's and it's okay it can actually be good um so we had to we had to break a lot of people out of those out of those uh, preconceived notions they already had because, you know, I remember one day I was serving this dish that was like a sous vide halibut, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, perfect halibut, cooked for 45 minutes at 132 degrees, uh, served over um, a ginger infused carrot butter with a raw fennel salad, roasted black garlic chive oil, and some other shit that was on it. And then so <laughs> I'm walking around the restaurant, this lady's like, oh my God, this is the best soul food I've ever had. I was like, <laughs> wait, I didn't know soul food <laughs> had some black truffles with sous vide. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, I was like, oh, well, thank you. I'm just curious, what 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 a part what part of that dish said soul food to you? And she she's like, huh? Mm -hmm. And I see what was going on with the in her, through her mind. She's like, did your black ass hands make it? <laughs> it's soul food. Soul food. <laughs> Wow, that's hilarious. <laughs> Can we... that's, a, that's, a, that's an ongoing battle, but you know. Wow. So let's talk a little bit then. You talked about some of the ambiance that you did, right? Taking from your European um, travels of like making the restaurant more communal. Can you talk more about the menu then, about how um, both your travels, right, of wanting to break out of that box, but also your heritage um, influenced the menu? Yeah, so I mean, the menu is just really a celebration of uh, our experiences and what we like to eat, right? Like at first when I opened up, it was like, you know, every chef has a chip on his shoulder. I got to prove something, yada, 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 show you how far I can go, 16 different ingredients on a plate and garnish and everything all, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. um, which is not sustainable and it's not good. It's not true, it's pretentious, it's fake, it's forced. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately is what it lends, well, you know, that's the way it's perceived at least. Mm -hmm. um, but so now what it is, is just, it's just really just a celebration of, like I said, my experiences and what I like to eat when I travel the world. And me and Chef Kang, like before, you know, up to two years ago, we travel the world once a year and we just go consume Michelin stars and we bring interpretations of our favorite things back. We never eat in Houston because we don't want to be inspired by the place that we live. You know what I mean? We never want to copy anything that's from there. We want to be as original as possible. Um, and so, yeah, you see those techniques. You see things from, you know, from Vietnam, Kang's Vietnamese, you see things from you see Vietnamese influences, which will be you know our char grilled octopus over a, a nuck mom a curry vinaigrette with roasted peanuts and cilantro and uh, Korean pepper. You'll see Korean influences with our house made collard green, uh, creamed collard green kimchi that's served underneath our double uh, double bone and uh, sous vide pork chop with serrano cheddar grits. Like it's just a great mashup of just you know, beautiful flavors from everywhere and just showing how, you know, just like with the restaurant industry and just like with the idea of the restaurant, you can pull all this stuff together to make like one beautiful, like, <clears throat> course, I guess. No, I mean, we, don't have to be from, we don't all have to be Baptists to sing a good hymn. You know what I mean? Like we can, you can, you can just, you know, we, we know what we're trying to do. We're trying to, trying to do whatever hymn singers are trying to do, which is praise. I guess. <laughs> I 
<laughs> no, I mean, what you're saying sounds delicious, especially the idea of a collard green kimchi. Like, that sounds like amazing but innovative and something that's fresh and new but like you said bringing together those different fusions those different roots and coming out with a product like you said that sings so I think ultimately that's what um you know being a restaurateur is about is that kind of groundbreaking type of stuff so that's exciting and clearly you're doing something right you're celebrating eight years which is amazing I know the restaurant industry is very cutthroat so um you sound like you bounce back good from that review and have just been ever since doing well so what advice would you give to someone who is thinking about starting their own restaurant? Oh, shit. Well, if you can start your own restaurant, <clears throat> um, what's, I guess the first thing is about starting and then the third thing is about sustaining it. Um, one, you absolutely have to love it because there's the, the, the margins in restaurants are terrible. Your overhead should live like around 90%. So that means like best case scenario your profit margin is going to be 10%, best case scenario. And it's only getting harder uh, in this new world that we're living in where you have to have a huge to-go component. To-go containers aren't cheap. Proteins aren't cheap. The market's fluctuating every single day. So it has to be a passion project. You can only do it if you love it. If you're a venture capitalist and you just want to go play, then the way you make a small fortune is you start off with a large fortune. Start large and you'll lose a lot of money and then you'll have a nice small one. Um, so, so you got to love it. Um, the second thing is <laughs> you got to love it so much that you're willing to take a penance every single day. You have to be the definition of a mas masochist and you have to beat the shit out of yourself every single day. You have to like, you have to be your own teacher and student and you have to be prepared to give yourself an F every single day and be willing to strive for a every day and know that you'll never hit it because perfection is not a real thing. It's just a pursuit. Um, so there's that. And then as far as like the sustainability, I want to, one more thing uh, that, that I really learned this year that was really driven home to me. <clears throat> Once you get up and running, um, or even before that, be sure the community is in the, is, is in the front of what you're doing. Be passionate about it, but think about the genesis of restaurants, why they serve a purpose, why they'll always be around. It's because they're meant to serve the community. They're meant to be that community hub and all that kind of stuff. So with that stuff in mind, you need to go ahead and make the investment in community. That needs to be a part of your ethos from the very ethos from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Because if you invest in the community, ultimately the community will invest back in you. And that's why I believe that we're that we were able not only to like survive that year of 2020, but thrive and be able to help a lot of other people in the process. Um, and then once you get going, the most important thing uh, that because I mean, if you're going to open up a restaurant, you're not a restaurant tour. You're not you're an entrepreneur. And what people forget is like, or maybe they don't realize, or and maybe I just realized it last year as well, is like businesses don't die or fail. You know, entrepreneurs quit. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no quitting us. And you can't, I mean, like you can make it happen. You can make it work. It's going to be nasty. You may have to do a lot of stuff yourself um, and your profits will die. But there's, there's a way to be sustainable until you can get back to making profits. So. Yeah, those are the four most important things. Wow. Uh, that's, thank you for laying that out there. That definitely sounds like something that can be very rewarding, but very difficult. So all kudos to you for continuing on and serving the community. I mean, you talk about being community minded, not only if you're serving your restaurant, right, but you also went even further than that um, to really give back to the community around you with founding 1913. So I know you talked a little bit in the beginning about that, um, but can you talk more? So what made you decide to start this in the first place? How did you get support behind you? Um, yes. Okay, well, I mean, so what made me start is just like the need, right? So when we started feeding first responders, we saw that, of course, see, a lot of people, well, I don't want to even talk about what other people do, but I just saw that a lot of people were targeting uh, the first responders, like breakfast and lunch, because that's when their staff was there, and that's what's easy, and, you know, to do it. But who was thinking about the graveyard shift people? Always forgotten. And so that, that you know, unconsciously, subconsciously, that became our approach is like, we don't go after the people that are forgotten because you have to be considered to be forgotten. We go after the people that aren't even considered. Wow. So we went after the graveyard shit, shit, not shit, shift, the <laughs> graveyard shift exclusively uh, from jump. And then we had an opportunity to go work with them. Um, and my father's side of the family, part of his side of the family is from Sunnyside, which is a you know historically black neighborhood on the South side of Houston. And I spent a lot of time over there. So I know Sunnyside 
And so there's a community over there that I wasn't aware of called uh, Anna Dupree, had 127 residents, um, all elderly subsidized living. Some of these um, places didn't even have kitchens in them. And these old people are now cut off from their families due to the risk that this pandemic poses to them because you can't come up over there and come see grandma because you may get her, you may give her a fresh coat of COVID and that's it. So granny's on her own, but there's no meal plan for granny. So she has to go out over to the grocery store and go fend for herself, which is the worst place to be, the worst place to be. So we started, um, we started doing these mills and then I saw the other mills, and they, no, they were getting mills from somebody else. And I went over there and I saw it. And I think it was from like Zoe's Kitchen or something. And they were getting paid through World Central Kitchen. And I was like, dude, there is no consideration for these people in this. Like, it's almost like dehumanizing because you're like, hey, we're going to get paid $10 a plate. We don't know these people don't really care, but here's some food. And I think it's going it's to have your protein, it's going to have your starch, it's going to have your veggie. You're welcome. Now keep it moving. And these are my people. And so they, I mean, they changed the world for us. So they deserve more respect than that. I mean, all elders deserve something. They deserve a meal that, that's, that's crafted and with consideration of them, with their life experiences, their palate. And so we set about creating um, 30 days worth of, 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 of menus that were deliberately curated to speak directly to their palates, their life experiences, and their nutritional needs. So we did that. And the thing with that kind of thing is like, you know, so I delivered the meals the first time and it's like, uh, you know, you just know these people, like there goes Aunt Lucille, there's Uncle Willie, there's Chad who just got out of jail. Hey, what's up, Mr. McPherson? I don't know these people, but I know them. You know the characters, yeah. Yeah, and you can't stop. Like once you get started, you can't stop. So I went from doing that 127 people to uh, at the peak, which was last month, we did 100, we were doing 1500 meals a day. Um, and so, yeah, it was meant to serve our community, our elders who are not considered. And we wanted to give them, we wanted to give them the respect that they deserve through food. And people sleep on the power of a meal. And they also sleep on the power of what it means to somebody who's sitting out over there, like quarantined, isolated every single day and have a younger person who's thinking about you bring this and put it in your hands and, and you know, and let you know that you matter and you're considered. Yeah. Um, like it's, it's really impactful. And so... We started doing that and it was just me and two older Hispanic ladies uh, who didn't know how to cook. <laughs> so how, how did this work then? It hurt. That's how it worked. It hurt. And so, uh, but that, that grew from that until like now we have, and we're only eight months in it or nine months in it. Oh no, we're in it. We're like nine months in it. And so it grew from that to now we have about 18 employees. Uh, we have two kitchens about to open up two more in Fort Bend. And the point, what I'm trying to do is create these whole communities, right? Mm -hmm. We're like, so not only are we giving fish to these communities, we're teaching them how to fish. And the way that we're teaching them how to fish is that we're hiring. Like, I don't believe in volunteers because volunteers, you can't hold them accountable for one because I feel like it, I don't feel like it. And two, volunteers, I mean, that, that's a position that's born out of privilege. Like for you to go volunteer and work for somebody, you must not have to work that hard. All your bills must be able to pay. Like that's a privileged perspective. Um, I wanna hire people and let them get skin in the game and see the value of the work that we do with the, with the hope that once you do it, this will lead to a self-sustainable livelihood for you through the medium of food. So we have our, our first kitchen, which is in Hiram Clark which is actually where we had our kitchen where we built, uh, where we catered to build Blue Sills out of. Um, it's not the same place, but it's, you know, it's around there. And so what we started to do is attach gardens to every kitchen. So we have one in Hiram Clark and we have one in Fifth Ward. Both of them, uh, Hiram Clark's more Hispanic, Fifth Ward's historically black. Mm -hmm. The garden component was born out of the idea like, okay, so we're feeding my elders. I want them to have the best ingredients possible. Mm -hmm. So let's grow it, let's grow it. And if we grow it, then we can hire people and teach them about the full life cycle of food from seed to harvest to preparation to responsible disposal. And then we're able to teach them. So now we're developing, we have a farm system that's going to develop like the, the wokest workforce in the game, because now you're learning large scale production. You're, lar you're learning large scale from production from chefs because it's me and chef Lawrence, who, who's our culinary director now, who's a brilliant brother, brilliant. 
who's uh, on. And so now you, you get to see the approach. Like, we're not just doing like shit in the pot. Like, no, we're going to pill it and you're going to get technique. You're learning how to do food. So like in the food that we do over 1913, this is not mass product. This is not mass produced kind of products. This is what we do. And not at Lucille's, not, you know, because I mean, you just don't have that kind of money to do it on that scale. But it's stuff that's born out of care. And it's that, it's that kind of approach, that attention to detail that we're doing because everything's scratch ingredients. So you know how to, you know how to identify good produce. You know how to process it. You know how to package it. You know how not to waste. You know how to compost now. So you get the full circle and we're employing people to do all that stuff. Everybody gets paid. So you get, you get skin in the game immediately. And we're going even further than that. So sort of like I'm creating this little ecosystem Mm -hmm. um and i'm really pumped about it but it's an ecosystem because unlike most nonprofits, or i and i'm new to this game so you know bear with me but i feel like the whole model is based on touching the community like just little you know little surface level boom little 16 note you know get a little prop yeah and then you move on um the model that i'm building is meant to empower people to discover what they can do on their own because it's a model that's based on them putting the work in from the beginning, but being compensated through the entire time. Like I'm not compensated like a minimum wage compensation. I'm talking about compensated a premium, yeah. but you can really value it. So when you come into our farm system, you're getting paid. you like, like we got people in Kittleton, Texas who only make $15,000 a year, um, 397 residents, 92% black. That's where I'm starting this. Like you're going to get paid $15 an hour to do this. So if you do 40 hour work weeks, you're already making what, what close to $9,000 more than the average person out there. So there's value in here. So go ahead and commit, put some skin in the game and we're gonna build and we're gonna serve this community first. Now the stuff that comes out of this 10 acre farm, we're gonna use the leftover after we serve the people of Kendleton who are 15 miles away from any fresh food sources. After we serve them first, then we're gonna take the food over to Richmond, Texas. In Richmond, Texas, they're dealing with uh, homelessness. So we're gonna start pr prepping the mills. We're gonna put that harvest into production in Richmond and then we're going to hire 15 people from Richmond and those people that we're going to train them up in the culinary arts and then we're going to take our scraps and our whole food waste and then we're going to go to Rosenberg and we're going to put it in the fermentation lab and the fermentation lab we're going to teach these people in cooking 101 the stuff that we that I mean that's how this country was built and learning how to get seasonality out of saving and holding foods and then we're going to take all those products put them back in the community the scraps we're going to compost and put them back in the earth and now it's a full self-sustained ecosystem that's born out of people. That the ones that are in need or the ones that are providing are also the beneficiaries of their own work. Wow, I'm absolutely, like, this is amazing work. Like, I'm literally like, wow, this, if this- I can see your goosebump. I can see your goosebump. Right yeah, I, no, literally, like, I mean, like, but I taught in Chicago before moving here to New York for, um, for law school, and I was in a food desert, so we're on the west side of Chicago, horrible food, and they were talking about, like, ownership of grocery stores and things, and, like, like my students were preschoolers, they ate horribly, so right. hearing this and you hiring people for jobs where they're getting paid well, not exploited by a Wendy's, like, right. I commend you on this, like, this yeah. is definitely what, part of what I love about food, so. And, you know, and another thing, and I'm glad you mentioned that, man, because there's so many programs that they want to teach these kids that come from these, you know, these tough environments. They want to show them the benefits of, you know, fresh foods and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, listen, okay, so you teach them and then they go home and they say, hey, mom, look, you know, look what we can do with some fresh stuff. Well, mom's like, yo, that's 15 miles away. Are you going to go get it? Are you going to go get this? All that does is just create more angst in the home. There can't be any healing done unless the parents are good. Until the parents are sustainable, that's how you get way. I mean, that's the only way some real impact can happen. So that's who we're targeting. The babies, I love you. But I want your parents to be good so the parents can love you better, right? Like, that's that's the whole part. philosophy, even for young, early child education. It's a child parent. Like, the parents are key. People forget that. They think they can just help the children. Yeah. Nothing comes from that, whether it's food, education. So, no, I love that you're doing this because you're not only – helping them being like with food, but also that's sustaining communities, more money being poured in from those people. So you're helping sustain things for the long run. Um, so this is amazing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, it's always cute. And, you know, cameras love babies. I love, I'll hold a baby all day. <laughs> but let's get it. Let's get a healthy, comfortable parent to hold that baby. You know what I mean? Let's let them to do that with confidence and not with desperation. So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a real holistic kind of approach that we're trying to do. And I, I don't know that it's been done. If it has been done, I'd love to look at it so I can get some kind of clue on how to make this shit happen. But I haven't seen it yet. 
I just know I don't gonna... either. When you're describing this to me, honestly, the first thing I was thinking is this is the type of stuff that needs to be replicated throughout the country. So I'm glad that you're like, you know, starting in Texas, starting in Houston and branching out. But I see this potential going even further. So I'm definitely excited to see where you take this. Um, yeah, yeah. Get, you know, if you can find me some funding. <laughs> no, you're not. We need some funding. <laughs> I feel it. I'd it's love not... to do it across the country. And you asked me one other question about how we find funding to do it. We didn't because I don't know anything about fundraising. I'm a restaurant guy. So everything that we did for the first nine months, no, eight months of the 1913 initiative was completely funded by Lucille's. We took all the profits that we had and we put it into that. And, um, and the reason why we were able to do that is because when the world changed, I made a commitment to my staff that we're going to keep 100%, 100 of the people on. We will not furlough anybody. We'll find a way for you to get exactly what you average so you can maintain comfort as long as you feel safe and comfortable, then you'll have a home here. And um, oh, and so the way that we were able to do that, we had conversations with all of our vendors and our landlords like, yo, if we're not taking a profit, you don't need to take a profit either. I'll pay costs. You pay costs so we can all keep business going because we're not going to recover from this. It's not like we can go to, you know, fast forward to February and things hopefully are a little bit lighter and I'll be able to recoup some of this money. No, it's gone. It's gone. So for you to keep a, a building with the tenant, for you to keep a customer to continue ordering, everything needs to go down to just cost. So that made us a lot more profitable and we weren't, our model wasn't meant to be profitable. So we took that extra money and that's how we did 1913. And just now we're starting to get some real uh, support. Wow. So hopefully so the fact that you're able to do all that though, not only keep your staff on, right? All those kind of things. Also start a whole initiative that was funded by the profits. That's a big thing to show, right? Cause there's a lot of places that, and we know people have different circumstances, but the fact that you're able to do all of that at once is, is very commendable. So I'm saying good luck to that. I'm going to definitely keep up with it and hopefully get some more funding on and get some experts in like 501c3 stuff to get some more funds. There's so much money out there. Like, can we talk a little bit? You talk a lot about the importance of elders, right? You're serving the elders with 1913. You're helping the communities that they live in. But everything that you kind of started was inspired by your own elder, right? Lucille, your grandmother. And you talk... You talk some about, you know, how she was known in Houston. Can you talk a little bit more about her legacy and how it inspired you? Yeah, so she was known throughout the country. She was one of those, this is my great-grandmother, and she was, uh, you know, she created the country's first hot roll mix, which was jacked by Pillsbury and built their, their empire. That's verified by the Chicago Tribune in 2014. I'm not surprised um, at all. <laughs> and then, and then uh, she, her, her original recipes, and we served two of them, the chili biscuits and the hot rolls, which were both iterations of that hot roll mix she came up with all those years ago over 100 years. Was, uh, oh and so she she was also one of the first national uh african-american food editors in the country through sepia magazine which then became ebony she i mean we named the business after 19, uh, 1913 because it's not a delta thing i wish i would have thought a bit more forward thinking about that because then we could have got some delta dough but it didn't but so it's um it's, that's the year that she started her business for the exact same reason. Her community was in need. She started working through the churches to, to serve her community. So it's the exact same ethos with us. Um, she uh, authored the first commercial culinary educational program in the country through Prayer View University. She offered all the text. She led the class. I mean, she was a beast. And she's one of the first women in the country to file Femme Sol, which is Latin for a woman alone. Her and my great grandfather, who was a barbecue artisan, and um, like a butcher she she he already had his business up and going she wanted to do her business back in those days a woman couldn't do anything without her husband signing off on it she loved her husband but she's like baby i need to have control of my own shit i love her yeah so she filed for that i mean it's it's, it's incredible yes she filed for that so she can get full control over her own business and they stayed happily married until death did part and had their own very successful business she also authored her cookbook in 1941, which is just which is just now, you know, hitting the national stage again. I guess for five five years ago, with Tony Tipton Martin and the Jemima Code, who um, mm -hmm. brought it back to light. And um, yeah, and uh, she she's a giant. She's a giant. That's whose shoulders I get to stand on. Um, those are definitely some heavy shoulders, but that's amazing. Like she was doing all that stuff back then. Like I think you don't learn about that in school about people, right? You learn about like you know slavery hadn't been that long when you hear about Jim Crow, but hearing about people who were doing their thing in the early 1900s, like that is absolutely amazing. So kudos to her, and I'm glad that you're continuing to carry that on and that giving back and pushing through the different odds. So that is absolutely amazing. In the rise, you inspired two dishes. So you have a marinated croaker collar. It's the first time I heard of that before, as well as lettuce racks with um, roasted po uh, pork. 
And so why do you think these dishes relate to who you are? Why do you think you would inspire these type of dishes? I mean, so I, I, for one, it's an honor. It's an absolute honor to be listed with those giants that are in that book because those are the most influential, not black culinary minds, culinary minds, period, in the game. Those, those are some heavy hitters. And I don't know what the hell I'm doing there with them outside of my great grandmother. I can see from talking to you while you're in there. So give yourself more credit. <laughs> yeah, okay, you know, hey, I'll just take it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll take it. But um, I, the best I can imagine is that uh, that really speaks to what we were doing. Because, I mean, when we first opened up, we were doing collar, right? And, like, what Black-owned restaurant at that time was doing collar? You didn't see it. And we were doing collar with the Indonesian sambal curry on top of it with fried Brussels sprouts. Like, so, I mean, it's out of the box. It's, it's, it's not what you would expect kind of thing. Those who don't know, can you say what collar is? I had to Google it myself. Yeah. Collar is like the throat. It's just above the throat. Uh, it's like the, 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 like the jaw part of a fish. Mm. And there's just a little nugget of meat right there that is the sweetest piece of um, fish on the, on the fish. It's like the oyster on a chicken. It's a little bit of uh, the little nugget, the little morsel that's in the back behind it, beneath the thigh bone. Mm -hmm. It's like that, but it's right here on your jaw. It's, yeah. it's and okay. you can see it a lot in, um, in, in uh, Japanese restaurants. They call it a, I don't know what they call it. They call it something. <laughs> I know that sounds so like you said kind of going with that those innovations blending cultures blending flavors together which seems to be what you do so that's excellent um and then um I just wanted to ask you how do you define black food then since you are about kind of fusion and, and putting flips on things color green kimchi right that's a little different from what you know your great grandmother was probably cooking so what do you how do you define it uh, I don't think it can be defined I mean because black I mean I, and I'm kind of sick of people trying to put it in a box you know what I mean because the fact is I can tell you what it is. It's the base of the only original cuisine in this country. The only thing that's truly American comes from black kitchens because the fact is they had free black cooks for a long time. And so therefore we were tasked with becoming not only, not only feeding um, the country, but also feeding the privileged people well. And that's where the mastery of the art was born. And it's a fusion of our flavors, our techniques from Africa, along with the, the French shit that they thought that they wanted. Um, and it's just, and then, you know, and then utilizing the ingredients that were available. So it's the only original art, American art form, um, that and jazz and blues, which all come the same place. That's so like soul, though, right? You got the soul food, the music for the soul. So it all comes back to just that spirit. That's, yeah. that's a great definition. But that being said, I mean, like the way that we learned in these kitchens, like we had to, we had to take on everything. And, you know, I was just in Uzbekistan last year. And I heard the amazing story about a black chef out there who was a master of, <laughs> yeah, Uzbekistan. Man, we're everywhere. How did you, how did, like, how did we get out to Uzbekistan? We're everywhere and we're doing everything. And I was out there doing a food diplomacy tour. <clears throat> so I just don't, I mean, I don't think that we should be limited. I mean, like if you can have all these, you know, white chefs coming out there appropriating everything that we're doing and now they're the ambassadors of Mexican food and they don't even speak Spanish or now the uh, Ghanaian food, you know, you've been to Ghana once and now it's just when the cameras were there. If you can be an ambassador of that and you have the freedom to go ahead and appropriate everything else, why the fuck can't we take credit for what we do? I agree. Because we did it for free. I agree, no, and did it, and did it very well. So no, I definitely agree with that. Um, and so then just to, for a couple kind of like quick fire questions, um, what are five must have ingredients that you always have in your home kitchen? Wine. Beer, cigarettes, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, <laughs> yeah. no, uh, collard greens because I just made a beautiful collard green salad yesterday. I'm in quarantine, they just brought the rations to me, and it's actually nice. Um, so citrus, collards, um, some kind of pork, something not tenderloin, but bacon, ham hock, something because pork's just so delicious, uh, butter, and uh, garlic. Yeah. That sounds, no, those, that sounds like the making of a delicious, especially part of collard greens, especially with the new year coming. Um, so that's excellent. Um, what is your favorite dish to make at home? Man, so I just started cooking at home since I've been in this isolated quarantine. I don't cook at home ever. And it's a different energy. The best thing that I've made so far is uh, bread. Went back to making my own fresh bread. There's nothing like a fresh slice of bread. Like it can be delicious. <laughs> yes. And the process is so ancient. Like it's just, it's beautiful. And then you step outside and you walk back in and you smell that bread. 
and then when you break it open, uh, there's nothing like it. We're going to have a good time for all of us in quarantine. I'm sure <laughs> some good food happening. I'm from coming back. <laughs> Listen, enjoy yourself. What is your dream food destination? My dream food destination? Um, Benin. Mm, that's funny because I'm actually going to be, the next thing I'm cooking is like something from Benin, from the cookbook. But why Benin? Gumbo is probably what you're going to be doing. Um, just because uh, you can see so many um, parallels. Like, I love Oaxacan food. Oaxacan. Oh, yeah, and the Mexican. Okay, yes. Because yeah, you can see the immediate influences of West African cuisine on that. You can just see it. Um, yeah, because, yeah, Oaxaca is in the southern part of Mexico, and it was uh, one of the most big, inf mo most influential people from Oaxaca is a guy named Gaspar Yanaga, who was from West Africa, came over as a slave, broke free, fought the Spaniards for 40 years. They finally awarded him his freedom, and you can see his influence through everything that they do, from the mole, through the black art, it's all this, like, it's just, it's, 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 it's You're huge. Right everywhere. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So Benin, that would be very cool. Um, what legacy would you hope to leave on the culinary industry? I'd be happy if I could do anything that was even close to what my great grandmother did. I just want to do good work um, and not be limited by this because I got enough problems with this. I want you to see the work. I feel like you're using, you know, this and the, the history and the culture and everything that it brings for nothing but good, right? So hopefully that's what other people need to also be able to see. Um, are you working on any projects now that you would like to share? I mean, I know you're, talk about why you're in Nova Scotia quarantining right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have the ecosystem that I'm building, which I have, which will be in, uh, will will be running by uh, April. Um, and here in Nova Scotia, I'm here to see my sons and we're also opening up our first restaurant in Canada which is going to be, it's called the Mills. It's a celebration of this great Lebanese family that I'm taking the restaurant over from. Um, they've been here for 40 years. Yeah, I was like the only artisan butcher in the, in the province. And so it's going to be a celebration of Nova Scotian ingredients with uh, Lebanese influences. Wow. The great thing is, there are no Black-owned businesses out here, so we're really about to check it out. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure. Can you talk just briefly about what Nova Scotian ingredients are? Yeah, no, it's... Uh, they, I mean, so it's only going to be a seasonal restaurant. It's a lot. Of, the oyster game is incredible. Okay. Uh, seafood's great. I think it's underutilized out here. It's just like Alaska. They have great salmon, but they ship it all out to different places. And then we sell American stuff that's from Venezuela or Chile. Um, so, yeah, and the, 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 it's, it's, the, the produce is beautiful. It's a lot of local farms, plenty of farming out here. So the vegetables in the summertime are, are, are gorgeous. Uh, and, of course, fantastic seafood, beef, not so much. So it'll be more seafood friendly. Um, but no, that sounds great that you're bringing the farm to table, that freshness and seasonality even up there to Canada, which is excellent. Um, excited to see what you do with everything from 1913 to this new venture. Thank you so much for sitting down and talking with me. It's been a pleasure. And I'm excited to hear what comes from all of this. So thank you.